Great. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, always good to be back here uh, at the uh, Farm Press Center. Um, glad we could time it uh, before the big game this afternoon, um, which we'll all be watching. Uh, actually, this originally showed up on my schedule at 4.30, and that was a problematic uh, time for me. Um, but uh, I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to go through um, a range of issues that are obviously taking place. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple um, at the outset uh, and then take your questions. Uh, first of all, uh, our uh, team is uh, en route or about to be en route to Vienna uh, for the next round of uh, negotiations uh, with the P5 plus 1 uh, and Iran with respect to the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, we have a July 20th uh, deadline uh, associated with the Joint Plan of Action. Uh, to date, we have seen a very good uh, progress made in the implementation of the Joint Plan of Action uh, with Iran meeting its commitments to uh, again, uh, get rid of its stockpile of 20 percent enriched uranium, um, uh, not install uh, new advanced uh, centrifuges, uh, provide for additional transparency, um, not move forward uh, with uh, the progress of its Iraq reactor. Um, so across the board, uh, we've seen good compliance from Iran on its commitments with respect to its nuclear program, uh, and in return, we have provided the uh, limited sanctions relief uh, in the Joint Plan of Action. At the same time, there have been negotiations towards a comprehensive agreement, which was uh, the purpose of this uh, joint plan of action and a period of six months of negotiation. Those have been serious and substantive discussions. Uh, at the same time, however, uh, we do have gaps uh, that need to be closed. Uh, our view here is that uh, Iran now has a choice uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, they should be able to demonstrate that their program is peaceful. The international community and the P5 plus one has made clear that we uh, will uh, respect the right of Iran to have a peaceful nuclear energy program, provided that they can provide confidence and assurance that that program is peaceful, uh, meet their international obligations, uh, allow for the necessary transparency, accept uh, the necessary limits uh, on uh, their nuclear program to provide that assurance. Um, thus far, Iran has not um, taken the steps necessary in this negotiation uh, to provide that assurance. Uh, in fact, they've been very optimistic in their public comments about reaching an agreement, uh, but we are going to need to see them take additional steps uh, in the negotiations for there to be uh, a comprehensive resolution. Uh, so we're hopeful that we can make uh, progress in narrowing those gaps and pursuing that comprehensive resolution, but uh, the Iranian side is going to have to take additional steps um, that it should be able to take, frankly, uh, if, in fact, their nuclear program is peaceful. Uh, and that will be a key focus of ours in the coming weeks. Uh, President Obama has been following uh, the progress of those negotiations uh, closely. This has been a top priority uh, for our administration, uh, and it will be a focus of ours in the, uh, again, the days to come. Um, I just say one additional thing on Iraq, um, which is that uh, uh, the United States very much welcomes the announcement that Saudi Arabia will be providing $500 million in humanitarian assistance to Iraq. Uh, given uh, some of the tensions in recent years. I think this is a significant uh, show of support uh, from Saudi Arabia to the people of Iraq at a very difficult time. Um, Secretary Kerry had very productive discussions with King Abdullah when he was in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and again, we see this as a positive step forward. Uh, what we've said is all that the, the neighbors in the region have a stake uh, in addressing the crisis in Iraq and reducing the tensions uh, inside of Iraq uh, and also meeting uh, some of the urgent uh, needs, including humanitarian needs of the, pe of the people of Iraq. So I just wanted to be sure uh, to make clear that we in the White House uh, very much welcomed uh, that uh, Saudi announcement uh, today. Uh, with that, I'd be happy uh, to take questions. Yep. Uh, before you, we ask our questions, please wait for the microphone because we're transcribing and our friends in New York need to hear this as well. And please identify yourself and your outlet <coughs> when you ask the question. In New York, if you have questions, please step up to the podium and we will see you just like we see you now. Great. We'll start over here. Thank you, Ben. Um, Hisham Burar, Al-Hora TV. Um, what has changed in your assessment of the Syrian opposition to think or to lead you to think that with $500 million they will be able to fight uh, the ISIL while they couldn't uh, withstand um, uh, the uh, uh, Syrian regime? I mean, this is the same, the same group that President Obama himself called them a few days ago, that they're a bunch of farmers and teachers and pharmacists. Well, uh, first of all, um, much has changed in our assessment of the opposition, uh, not just today, but over the course of the last several years. 
what President Obama was saying is at the outset of the Syrian um, protest against the Assad regime, uh, many of the protesters were not trained fighters. Um, they were ordinary citizens who were standing up and demanding their rights. Uh, so that was an assessment he was making, uh, the comments he made the other day, that didn't apply to the opposition today. It applied to the opposition at, at the outset um, of this uh, crisis. As he indicated, over the course of the last uh, two or three years, we have gotten to know the opposition much better. Uh, and we have steadily expanded the types of assistance that we provide for the opposition. That began with humanitarian assistance into Syria. That then led to uh, the provision of non-lethal assistance. Uh, and then we announced uh, a little over a year ago uh, that we were going to begin to provide certain types of military assistance to the opposition, uh, including the armed opposition. Uh, so there's been an evolving assessment and relationship, frankly, um, that we've had with the opposition. And again, it was important for us to develop that relationship in part so that we knew if we provided certain types of assistance, it would not fall into the wrong hands. Precisely because you have groups like ISIL uh, operating in Syria, we did not want to deal with people that we did not know very well. <laughs> um, because frankly, uh, the very presence of ISIL shows the risk mm -hmm. that if you're introducing certain types of lethal assistance, that could fall into the wrong hands. But we very much now have confidence uh, in the people that we are dealing with in terms of the Syrian opposition. Um, the 500 uh, million uh, provides for uh, the funding that could expand uh, the training and equipping of the opposition, but it would also provide new authorities so that the Department of Defense could conduct uh, this type of support to the opposition. Um, so it would expand, again, both the, the types of uh, support we provide and also uh, the different authorities under which our government can provide that support. Um, I think it's important to note that we see strengthening the Syrian opposition um, as a, a goal that relates not just to ISIL but still to the Assad regime. Um, so again, we believe it is important to say that there's a moderate opposition that we want to get behind. That's a counterweight to ISIL, but it's also very much a counterweight to the Assad regime which has uh, brutalized its own people. Uh, and frankly, uh, we believe that the source of the terrorism threat uh, in Syria is not simply ISIL. It's a regime that, through its own actions, uh, has created a humanitarian crisis, which has created space for extremists like, like, like ISIL. Uh, if we had uh, the type of political resolution that we've been seeking through the Geneva process, in which Syrians could f have faith in their own government, uh, you would not have the type of ungoverned spaces that ISIL has taken advantage of. So these are still interconnected problems uh, in which we're fighting uh, against a terrorist threat, in which uh, ISIL is at the forefront right now, in which we're tr uh, supporting a moderate uh, opposition uh, to be a counterweight to that terrorism threat, uh, but also very much we see the need for transition in Syria, uh, because until Bashar al-Assad uh, uh, leaves power, you're going to have um, areas of chaos and violence and instability in the country. Has that new level of comfort with the opposition uh, changed your opposition to giving them man pads, for example? Well, again, we tend not to get into the specifics of different um, weapon systems. Uh, it is the case, though, that our position hasn't changed with respect to that particular um, weapon system. Um, we're constantly reevaluating and assessing uh, what types of uh, assistance can make a difference and balancing that against uh, concerns about proliferation. So again, our position hasn't changed, but it's something that uh, we evaluate on a regular basis. Yeah. Hi, uh, Chen Weihua, China Daily. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, you know, the SED with China is coming in a week uh, from now. So, I mean, the two countries have been engaging sort of a more negative rhetoric or shouting game, probably people feel in the past months or so. And the kind of a sunny land spirit uh, people feel is lost. Do you think, I mean, uh, China and U.S. going to get back to that kind of a positive tone leading up to President Obama's trip to China in November? And also, do you think there's going to be a cyber talk after this, uh, at the SED, after this indictment of five PLA officers? Thank you. So um, we are optimistic that we can make good progress at the SNED uh, in terms of practical cooperation between the United States and China. I think when you look back at Sunny Lens and you look at the approach we've taken from the beginning of President Obama's administration, uh, and you look at the uh, new model of great power relations put forward by President Xi and President Obama and Sunnylands, it always allowed for the fact that we're going to have differences. 
Uh, I think the key point has been that the United States and China can have differences, articulate those differences publicly, um, but still find areas to cooperate, uh, that if we have a difference in one area, it need not derail the entire bilateral relationship, uh, because both of us have so much at stake in that bilateral relationship. And, in fact, the world has a lot at stake in that bilateral relationship. So, for instance, uh, we have had differences uh, with China with respect to cyber issues, um, and the indictments uh, speak to some of the concerns that we have. Uh, we've had differences over um, uh, certain territorial disputes and uh, maritime issues in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Um, at the same time, we continue to cooperate through the P5 plus 1 on uh, dealing with the Iranian nuclear program. We continue to have a very broad economic dialogue um, that has space for areas of agreement and cooperation and then occasional differences. Um, so, again, I think there's a, an ability for us to uh, find common ground, uh, develop areas of cooperation, even as we're going to be very uh, artic uh, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to be shy in articulating our differences. Um, so, as we look to the SNED, on economic issues, on climate change, on strategic issues. I think there's good space for dialogue. Uh, part of that dialogue will be um, both sides, I think, uh, articulating where there are differences. Cyber, I, I do think the cyber dialogue will go forward. Uh, again, it's better that we uh, talk to one another about these issues, have a forum for sharing information, um, raising concerns, um, and working through those issues. And so. Uh, the cyber dialogue that was set up out of the Sunnylands meeting, uh, I think, is an important forum. Uh, the SNED is a, the right venue for that dialogue to take place. Um, and again, just because we've made clear that uh, we're going to uh, insist that uh, rules and laws are abided by, uh, doesn't mean that we're not going to um, explore uh, areas of bridging gaps with, with China uh, through uh, the, the dialogue at the SNED. The talk or you're not sure it's having my, my expectation is that there'll be a, a, a cyber cyber dialogue yeah uh, we'll go to New York and take a question from there uh, Paolo Mastrolilli with the Italian newspaper La Stampa thank you very much for doing this uh, I have two uh, short questions the first one is the Italian Prime Minister Renzi is assuming today the European Union presidency what do you hope they uh, will do in order to uh, promote a, a policy for economic growth and possibly to finalize the TTIP treaty? And the second question is about uh, Israel, the killing of the uh, three boys, the reaction of uh, the Israeli government. How do you think that will impact the uh, peace uh, process and the uh, already very tense uh, region? Sure. Um, well, on the first question, um, let me just say President Obama and Prime Minister Renzi uh, have established, I think, a very good and close working relationship um, uh, that was developed on the President's trip to Italy, a variety of phone calls they've had, many of which focused on the crisis in Ukraine but also touched on broader European issues and uh, the program that Prime Minister Renzi is uh, pursuing in Italy. Um, and I think President Obama believes that uh, Prime Minister Renzi has brought a lot of energy uh, and uh, enthusiasm uh, to the project of governance, not just in Italy, um, but in Europe. Uh, and one of the things that they spoke about uh, is the need uh, to, again, revitalize the transatlantic alliance. Uh, and part of revitalizing the transatlantic alliance is, uh, again, uh, our encouragement of Europe uh, to play an assertive role in resolving both regional issues like uh, the crisis in Ukraine, but also serving as a, a global partner with the United States. So I think as we look to uh, the Italian presidency, um, you know, clearly on the economic side, uh, we have supported policies uh, within Europe uh, that promote growth, uh, that recognize that there's going to be a need for fiscal uh, uh, consolidation and austerity uh, in certain uh, places, but at the same time that if we're not catalyzing growth, um, ultimately uh, you're not going to have the type of uh, job creation um, and a generation of uh, revenue that is uh, going to be in service of uh, the global economy as well as dealing with issues like unemployment in Europe. Um, so I think we would support uh, Italy's focus uh, on growth uh, within uh, the Eurozone, even as, uh, again, they'll work with other uh, partners in Europe uh, to address fiscal concerns as well. Uh, I think on the broader agenda, uh, clearly Ukraine uh, is going to continue to be a focus of our relationship uh, with uh, the European Union. 
um, and that hopefully can lead to uh, affirmative support for the Ukrainian people uh, as they seek uh, to build on the progress of their election and their new government, um, but also uh, sending a clear signal to Russia that uh, ongoing violations of Ukraine's sovereignty or territorial integrity will have to bring additional uh, consequences and will coordinate closely with Italy uh, bilaterally and uh, within Europe uh, in that respect. Uh, on the second question, uh, first of all, uh, our hearts go out to the uh, families of the three teenagers um, who were found killed uh, yesterday. As the President said, uh, it's just a heartbreaking tragedy um, to lose uh, three young people like that. Um, we want to continue to support Israel uh, in trying to find those perpetrators and bring them to justice. Um, we believe that that uh, is done effectively with cooperation between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Um, and so we'll continue to encourage that uh, cooperation as well. At the same time, uh, we also have made clear that uh, there does need to be uh, restraint uh, on both sides so that uh, we don't see a further destabilization of the situation, uh, that we can focus on the issue of terrorism. Uh, there can be a focus on uh, bringing, obviously, these perpetrators to justice, uh, but at the same time, there has to be an avoidance of steps uh, that can further inflame tensions. Uh, and that's the type uh, uh, of uh, policy that we're going to continue to encourage going forward, uh, one that, again, focuses on countering terrorism, bringing perpetrators to justice, uh, but, again, avoids uh, further destabilization on either side, uh, because ultimately uh, the parties are going to have to work together to address both these very pressing security issues, uh, as we recently saw with this uh, tragic incident, uh, and also, uh, ultimately, uh, the pursuit of uh, peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, uh, well, we'll go to here and then to Andre. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I have a question about Iraq. Uh, my name is Wei Xuejiao from China Central Television. Uh, so, uh, as we know, the United States has increased military presence in Iraq recently, and the indications show Iran and Syria also uh, trying to support Iraq government to solving this problem. So uh, do you think, how do you evaluate their uh, actions, and do you think this will push Barack Obama administration to work with uh, Iran and Syria in Iraq crisis? What is the next step in solving Iraq crisis? Thank you. Yeah. So um, we believe that uh, a big part of the challenge in Iraq today is because of the ongoing tensions between different communities inside of Iraq, uh, sectarian uh, tensions uh, that have come from a failure to bridge different divides in terms of how uh, governance is implemented in Iraq, um, and a need for every community in Iraq, whether they be Sunni or Shia or Kurd uh, or Christian, uh, to be invested in uh, the future of Iraq. Uh, in the absence of an inclusive government and in the absence of inclusive security forces, uh, we believe there's going to continue to be tensions. ISIL is obviously taking advantage of those tensions. The reason that is related to your question uh, is because if Syria and Iran uh, are intervening inside of Iraq, that really is only going to feed those sectarian tensions. I, I don't think anybody would uh, expect Syrian or Iranian intervention, particularly military intervention, uh, to be in service of all of Iraq's communities. Uh, I think it would be uh, and has been perceived as favoring uh, uh, one community over others, and, and frankly, not just one community, but uh, you know, subsets within that community. Uh, that's why uh, we would not encourage or welcome or cooperate with in any way um, Iranian and Syrian uh, military intervention inside of um, Iraq. What we would say to all the neighbors is that if you have an interest in uh, reducing tensions inside of Iraq, uh, that you should be encouraging inclusive governance. Um, and frankly, here Iran could play a role um, in using their influence to encourage uh, an inclusive process of government formation, because it's not in Iran's interest for there to be this type of vacuum uh, in the Sunni areas uh, that ISIL has taken advantage of, um, that uh, Iran should not be uh, feeding uh, a sectarian politics uh, inside of Iraq. Uh, because, frankly, that is only, again, going to bring greater instability, which ultimately is not uh, in any of the neighbors' interests. Uh, so our message to Iran is the same message that uh, we would send all the neighbors, which is let's support an inclusive uh, politics inside of Iraq. Uh, and again, uh, today we welcome the fact that the Saudi Saudis stepped up 
uh, and through their provision of assistance, uh, I think are sending a signal that now is a time for countries to uh, look at this with a sense of urgency uh, and try to invest in uh, a different type of process going forward. Um, Andre, yeah. Just because I'm sanctioned doesn't mean that you and I can have a, a dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, friends at AFPC, as always, uh, congratulations on the U.S. national team successes, wishing every success in the coming match. Uh, President Putin uh, was speaking to the Russian ambassadors today, so all, all points from him. Uh, first, uh, he says, uh, we are not shutting down. We have no intention to shut down our relations with the U.S. These uh, relations are seriously important uh, for the world. Uh, my question, uh, is the U.S. still interested in uh, a further convergence uh, with Russia, or is it diverging on a diverging course? Uh, second point from him, uh, blackmail against French and their banks. Uh, he says this is done uh, specifically to uh, prevent the, Fran uh, the French from uh, selling mistrals uh, to Russia. Uh, thirdly, and uh, importantly for all journalists, uh, recently, uh, yesterday, uh, a Russian journalist was killed in Ukraine, a third one, uh, a colleague. Uh, this is a tragedy. They should stop. Putin claims that uh, this seems like a deliberate targeting of journalists. Uh, what can you say about that? Thanks. Yeah. On the, let me just take the third question first. Uh, we absolutely condemn uh, the targeting of journalists, and uh, our hearts very much go out to the Russian journalists who have been uh, killed or harmed in Ukraine. Um, we believe that uh, journalists deserve um, special protection um, and that the ability of journalists to cover events uh, is fundamental to what the United States stands for around the world. So, uh, again, our, our thoughts are with the family. Uh, of that journalist and all of the Russian and other journalists, frankly, who've been uh, harmed uh, inside of Ukraine. Um, on your first question, Andre, we very much want to work with Russia uh, where we can. Um, I think it's Im important to note that um, even throughout this very difficult period, um, President Obama and President Putin uh, have uh, determined to stay in touch with one another. Um, the ability of the uh, two of them to speak very candidly to one another um, is important. Uh, it allows for space uh, for diplomacy uh, and hopefully a reduction of tensions um, in Ukraine um, going forward. And President Obama uh, you know, coordinates very closely with Chancellor Merkel and President Hollande and Prime Minister Renzi and uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Cameron as well uh, in their discussions with uh, uh, President Putin. So on Ukraine specifically, um, we are, have had very significant differences with Russia, uh, as you know, um, but uh, we believe that we always need to keep that door open to diplomacy. More broadly, um, we uh, have been cooperating with Russia uh, through the P5 plus one. Uh, they have an important role to play um, in that process in insisting that uh, nonproliferation is upheld as a fundamental international norm. Um, and uh, so if you look at uh, the fact that we'll be at the table of this negotiation, uh, it's important that Russia uh, stand with the rest of the international community in uh, insisting that Iran meet its obligations. Um, so there are going to be areas of uh, cooperation between the United States and Russia, but we're going to have differences, and I think those differences have grown uh, obviously most acute over uh, Ukraine. Uh, but they're rooted not in any desire by the United States um, to seek out punishment for Russia. Uh, it's rooted in our belief that nations should be able to make their own decisions, whether it's uh, Ukraine or Moldova uh, or any other country. Um, people should have the ability to make determinations about uh, their own future, who they want to associate with. Um, and uh, that's what's guided our, our Ukraine policy uh, throughout uh, this whole process. And Russia has in the past, I think, uh, been an advocate for the notion of state sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, our point is that that has to apply um, in all neighborhoods, uh, including uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, your, your second question, Andre, was... Uh, uh, Mr. Al. Well, look, the, the settlement um, with uh, the, the French bank was... Uh, that's, as, as you know, something that's handled by our Justice Department. Um, we don't uh, politically interfere in that. It is important to note, however, that um, our concerns about uh, the potential French shale um, uh, and Mistral is, is separate from that case. Uh, and that's, frankly, more uh, an expression of a political concern. 
that this is not the right time, given the events in Ukraine, uh, to move forward with that type of uh, defense agreement. Um, so that's actually not related to a uh, specific U.S. sanction that's in place. Uh, it's more related to the fact that um, uh, this is not an opportune time to move forward with that type of um, defense transaction given ongoing events in, in, in Ukraine. Um, so uh, we would separate those two issues out. Um, we'll take one from uh, New York there. Uh, hello, this is Edward Zitnik, Slovenian Public uh, Television. Last week, when uh, Russian Foreign Minister's uh, visit to Slovenia was announced, uh, I think he's coming to Ljubljana on 8th of July, uh, American Embassy in Ljubljana expressed kind of concern. They said that the timing of the visit is not the best. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Obviously, United States are not very happy with the visit. Foreign Minister to Slovenia. Well, well sure. I, I think as a as a general matter, um, you know, we have sought to make uh, very clear that um, the United States and Europe um, are most effective in dealing with the situation in Ukraine and resolving uh, tensions in Ukraine when we are standing united and sending a very strong message to Russia that we are united uh, against any incursions into Ukraine, against any violation. Uh, of Ukrainian sovereignty, um, the continued uh, activity of separatists, and we believe uh, support for those separatists uh, coming from Russia uh, has been a concern. Um, so we do want to unite it from with our European allies. You know, clearly, obviously, again, Russia has relations uh, in Europe, and those will be ongoing. And uh, we've had ongoing conversations with Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, as it relates to diplomatic efforts on Ukraine and other issues. Um, again, I think our baseline has been uh, we also, though, need to be in close coordination, uh, and we need to be sending a common message to Russia uh, in all of our discussions. Um, and so that's the type of uh, policy that we'll continue to encourage. Uh, and again, that's not one that closes the door to any type of communication with Russia. It's just one that says that we need to be sending the same message. Uh, yeah, we'll go right here. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, this is Miko Mori from Fuji TV. Uh, this is about Japan. Uh, what is the White House reaction to the Japanese Prime Minister's Abe's reinterpretation of Constitution to allow collective self-defense? Considering the reaction of China and South Korea, are you worried about any effect this might have in uh, relations in, in Asia? And also, uh, with this collective self-defense, what is U.S. expecting Japan to do beyond what they do already? Thank you so much. Well, uh, President Obama discussed this issue with Prime Minister Abe when he was in Japan. And the United States very much welcomes uh, the steps that Japan has taken forward with respect to collective self-defense. And President Obama has been very supportive of this policy uh, of Prime Minister Abe's. Um, again, we believe it's part of the continued uh, maturation of our alliance, um, and it opens the door to additional cooperation. Uh, and when you look at uh, issues such as Japan's support for peacekeeping efforts around the world uh, or their commitment to regional uh, security and stability in Asia. Uh, I think this policy creates uh, space for Japan uh, to play uh, an even greater role um, as a security partner in the United States and as a, uh, a country that uh, upholds uh, international uh, order. With respect to the neighbors, uh, I think what we'd encourage Japan to do uh, is to be very transparent uh, about uh, its policies, be very clear about what uh, they mean and what they don't mean. Um, we uh, would welcome uh, their continued efforts to engage in diplomat uh, diplomatic uh, consultations with the neighbors uh, to have those discussions, particularly uh, the Republic of Korea. Uh, so we support Japanese efforts to uh, engage in diplomacy to make clear uh, what this new policy means and, again, to have a, a degree of transparency around it uh, so that uh, there are no misunderstandings. Um, and, again, we very much believe that uh, in terms of the region, uh, the United States wants our allies to get along. Uh, so we very much want to see Japan and the Republic of Korea to continue dialogue uh, to address not just collective self-defense, but also some of the uh, issues uh, around uh, historical tensions uh, that have emerged in, in recent months. Uh, but again, bottom line is the White House uh, welcomes the Japanese uh, announcement and the policy of collective self-defense, believes that uh, if it's uh, 
pursued with, in a transparent fashion uh, in consultation with uh, neighbors in the region, uh, that that can reduce uh, misunderstanding uh, and, and tensions uh, and contribute ultimately to uh, the stability and security of the Asia-Pacific region. Yeah. You know, expect Japan to do more, you know, beyond what they are doing right now. Well, I think that'll be an ongoing uh, process. I, again, I think J Japanese contributions to international security efforts, um, uh, peacekeeping, and other international um, uh, efforts to uphold rules and norms. Uh, you know, I think there's space for J uh, Japan to be a positive contributor in that respect. And, and then again, I think in the Asia Pacific, um, you know, we've had a uh, a security dialogue, obviously through our alliance, uh, we know Japan has uh, had uh, increasing dialogue with uh, other um, uh, partners in the region, um, and uh, you know I think we'll have to evaluate as this policy is implemented uh, what it means in practice. Uh, I, you know I think what people need to understand is it doesn't mean Japan is going to uh, engage in any destabilizing activity. I think it means that Japan is going to be better able to invest in um, the types of uh, international cooperation that supports uh, stability. So that's, uh, that's why we think it's a positive step forward. Uh, we'll continue to discuss with them and practice what it means on everything from exercises to, um, uh, to support for international um, uh, efforts beyond uh, Japan's borders. Um, we'll go, uh, I just want to move around regions here. So uh, the gentleman behind you there, yeah. Thanks a lot. Can you talk a little bit about uh, NATO, uh, that the summit is uh, coming in, in Wales, and what about open doors policy? I know we it's always say that it, we support open door policy and everything, but can you tell us more information about may, maybe position of Montenegro and Macedonia? By the way, I'm Ivo Puljic from uh, Al Jazeera Balkans. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think um, every summit, uh, you know, we obviously review the progress of uh, partner nations. Um, you know, we have an open door policy. I think if you look at countries like uh, Georgia and Montenegro, they are making good progress um, in terms of uh, their own plans. Um, and so I think uh, you know, at the the upcoming summit is an opportunity for the alliance to sit down with um, different countries, including Montenegro, including uh, Georgia, and other aspirants, uh, and to review the progress they've made uh, in cooperation with NATO uh, and um, figuring out how they can further uh, build their uh, relations with the alliance uh, and figure out what the pathway um, potentially is uh, to, uh, uh, to NATO membership. Um, so this is something that, that uh, again, uh, there's a very clear process for. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, we expect it to certainly be a topic um, leading into the summit in September uh, and a topic at, uh, at, at future NATO summits as well. Uh, and we want to encourage nations to stay on that track, and ultimately their people will, um, you know, their militaries and their um, governments will have to um, make the steps uh, necessary to uh, complete the process of um, their uh, membership action plans, uh, and their own publics will have to make their own decisions about uh, whether or not to, uh, to join the alliance. Um, so this is, a, is an ongoing process of cooperation, but uh, again, uh, we've had good progress in uh, in recent uh, months and years with Montenegro, and expect that to be the case going forward. Well, you did say for Macedonia. I'm sorry, I asked you for yeah. Macedonia also. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, all the aspirants. I mean, I think everybody um, is 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 at the table in this conversation, um, and uh, they're at different stages. So, uh, you know, I think we uh, we recognize that some nations are further along than others, um, but our goal is to have capable partners uh, of NATO. And to make clear to those partners that there's an open door, um, but that that involves an extended process, um, so that you know again, uh, uh, states are taking every step necessary to come into uh, to to come into uh, consistency with both the alliance practices, uh, but then also to have their publics express uh, the determination to join as well. Uh, we'll go over here. Yep. Thank you, very, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Atoshi Okudera from Asashim Japanese newspaper. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, yeah, my question was almost covered by my friend, but uh, uh, let me ask about uh, on China. Uh, as you said, you know, there are lots of, a couple of differences between uh, United States and China. Uh, you know, uh, there one year has passed since the last Sunnyland, and but uh, lots of things 
including declaration of the ADAZ and the maritime dispute in South China Sea and East China Sea. Lots of things happen. So, oh, and at the same time, the West Point speech, President Obama was concerned about the aggression uh, in, South China, in South China Sea. So my question is, uh, how uh, would you and the United States uh, raise uh, these concerns to the uh, Chinese leader this time in the SNED uh, next week in Beijing? The United States always an urge uh, Chinese leader to resolve dispute peace peacefully, and uh, uh, they should uh, follow the international law. Uh, but uh, how the United States let them, uh, the Chinese leader, uh, understand the importance of the of the uh, importance of the uh, international law and the norm? Uh, what is the strategy to solve this maritime dispute for the United States? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well. Um, Again, uh, I think clearly uh, issues associated with territorial disputes, maritime security, uh, have been uh, a key focus, not just in our bilateral conversations with China, but in the region more generally. Um, and the principles we apply to that are consistent to whatever country is involved, uh, which is we don't want nations to try to resolve those disputes through coercion. They are established international legal means uh, for resolving those disputes. Um, there are uh, negotiations underway around code of conduct to avoid unnecessary escalation between, for instance, uh, China and ASEAN countries. Um, and this will certainly be a, a topic at the SNED, um, uh, given how much it uh, is a leading topic in the region. Uh, and our point is simply that uh, we don't want to see a process where a big nation, a bigger nation can bully a smaller one to get its way on a territorial dispute. Uh, we want to see an understanding of what the international legal basis is for resolving uh, claims. Uh, and what the process is in the region uh, for avoiding um, uh, tensions. Uh, so I think we'll make uh, very clear the same points that President Obama made throughout his trip to Asia. Uh, with respect to the U.S. and China, though, I think it's also important that we have our own military-to-military -military dialogue uh, because we, too, want to avoid um, an inadvertent escalation or a misunderstanding. Uh, so we've sought to introduce greater transparency between our own militaries um, and uh, greater lines of communication. Um, and ultimately, that's the type of dynamic we'd like to see in the region, where um, countries are able uh, to work together, uh, again, to avoid miscalculation, uh, to avoid a confrontation that neither side is seeking, uh, and to find peaceful means of addressing problems, um, whether it be arbitration, uh, for instance, as the Philippines has pursued, uh, or uh, other means of uh, resolving uh, uh, claims. And the United States is not a claimant, but we do have an interest, obviously, in the uh, free flow of commerce and in the stability uh, of the region. So it'll be a topic at the SNED, uh, one among many, um, and I think you can expect that will continue to be a topic in our conversation with uh, all the countries in the Asia-Pacific region, given how much it's at the forefront right now. Um, yeah, we'll go here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Wada. I'm with Japan's Mainichi newspaper. Thank you very much for doing this. Kind of quick follow up to the J Japanese government decision to allow uh, the use of uh, uh, the right to collective self defense. There's a size of opposition inside the Japanese public about this government move. How would you address the kind of opposition inside the Japanese society? Thank you. Well, we uh, understand that, you know, there's clearly. Um, very deeply held views inside of Japan about these issues. Um, that's a process for the Japanese uh, people to determine. Uh, we respect the fact that Japan has democratic institutions and a very vibrant um, press, as is on display here today. Um, and, um, y you know, so we would not want to put ourselves in the middle of um, an internal debate uh, in inside of Japan. We'd, we'd expect there to be differences of opinion about um, any policy that. Uh, a democratic government pursues. That's certainly the case here. Uh, in terms of our alliance, uh, I think what we can make clear to the Japanese people is um, we welcome Japan playing uh, a growing role um, in terms of supporting international peace and security uh, and contributing to the U.S.-Japan uh, bilateral alliance. Uh, that's a sign of the progress that we've made uh, over the last several decades. Um, and so uh, uh, I think what we would make clear is that you know, we believe that this is good um, potentially for our alliance, uh, which has been very much in the interest of the U.S. and Japan, and I'd argue in the interest of the region. Um, I mean, the 
the, the, the network of U.S. alliances has provided the environment in which many nations have thrived um, and prospered. Um, and so, uh, again, um, we'll fully respect the internal Japanese debate. We'll look to the leaders in democratic institutions of Japan to sort through that debate. Um, and we will continue to look for ways to mature our own alliance because uh, we believe it's so profoundly uh, important to the United States and in, and in, our, in our own interests. Um, yeah, we'll go to the gentleman there. Uh, hi, my name is Yanni Bojewski, Voice of America. I have a question regarding the NATO enlargement, the same one. Uh, NATO insists that its open door policy remains. Uh, however, it doesn't seem that the new members we will receive at uh, this year's summit in Wales. Still, does the U.S. Uh, plan to pressure European allies in NATO to extend membership to Macedonia, Montenegro, and Georgia, thus giving them support that Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia received in light of the situation in Ukraine? Thank you very much. Yeah. Look, I, I don't think it's a matter of pressure uh, from the United States. Um, you know, NATO is an alliance. We make we take decisions together. So inherently, there's a collective nature to NATO decision making. Uh, I think what we would say to our European allies is uh, there's a very clear process. Um, everybody knows what the steps are that are necessary um, for, in terms of military modernization, uh, in terms of alliance interoperability, uh, in terms of um, you know enhanced. Uh, cooperation with NATO, and everybody should have the opportunity um, to, who has, a, a, again, a, a membership action plan and is an aspirant, um, to participate in that process and to be judged on the basis of their progress. Um, and uh, at, the t at the point in time in which um, I think nations can demonstrate that they've uh, fully uh, gone through that process and uh, are uh, a good candidate for membership uh, and have uh, the public support for taking that step, um, the alliance uh, has an obligation through its open door policy to take that seriously, um, but that takes time. Um, that you know, that there's a, there is a reason that NATO is um, uh, the best uh, and strongest alliance that we've had in history, and the reason is that uh, there's a very high standard of membership, uh, and there are very strong commitments that come with membership. Um, so it's it's natural that there be uh, an extended period uh, in which uh, nations uh, work through those issues. Um, so this will be addressed at this summit, um, but I think people should know, you know, the, the United States has always demonstrated, uh, not just in its words, but in its deeds, that uh, there's an open door uh, to NATO membership. And that certainly the, continues to be the case with all the aspirants. And that's what we'd say to our European allies, that we as an alliance have uh, committed to an open door, have committed uh, to nations that uh, if they w work through this process, that there's a pathway for them. Uh, however, we're an alliance, we take decisions together. Uh, there's a standard that needs to be met, um, and uh, we can all uh, work through uh, our view of how uh, far nations have come and how much farther they need to go to, to meet that standard. Uh, yep. Thank you. John Zhan with CTI TV of Taiwan. Ben, um, on the occasion of the uh, uh, presidential inaugura inauguration in Panama, uh, Secretary Kerry is said to be having a uh, chance encounter or informal meeting with uh, President Ma of Taiwan. What is the uh, significance of this meeting to uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations? And also, could you also comment on the uh, Taiwan's aspirations for inclusion in the uh, TPP uh, negotiations at an early date? Thank you very much. Um, I don't have the latest uh, on Secretary Kerry's engagements uh, to the panel, to be honest. Uh, so I, uh, we'd have to check on whether or not they did have an interaction. Uh, I mean, the fact is that, um, you know, the, in the international four that uh, Taiwan uh, participates in, um, it's not uncommon for us to have interaction with Taiwan. We obviously have very close economic and defense ties with Taiwan that are important to the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, even as we have a one-China policy, um, we uh, very much uh, look to reaffirm our commitment uh, to those longstanding um, political, economic, and, and defense ties with Taiwan. So I would imagine that that would be the nature of any uh, exchange that um, takes place. Um, uh, on, on TPP, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we're focused on uh, the current negotiation, uh, which is very much 
um, entering an end game uh, with the, the current um, participants in TPP. Uh, so, um, you know, I wouldn't want to uh, go beyond that in terms of uh, potential participation. Uh, you know, we have, you know, in APAC, for instance, we have a forum to, to coordinate with uh, Taiwan on economic issues. Uh, I think right now we're focused on getting TPP done, which is proving hard enough. Um, and uh, again, we have other venues through which we can cooperate with, uh, with, with Taiwan economically. Uh, the, yes, the lady uh, back there. Claudia Trevisan from the Brazilian newspaper Estado de São Paulo. I have two questions. Uh, the first uh, regarding Iraq. I'd like to know in which, condi which kind of conditions we would trigger a military action from the U.S. against the ECU in the Iraq. And the other one regarding Latin America, Argentina. Argentina is now facing the risk of an involuntary or technical default because of the decision of the American justice. Has the uh, Argentinian government anyway approached the administration? Has the President Kirchner talked with President Obama? And what kind of solution do you think it's possible in this case? Thank you. So um, on your first question, um, we, President Obama has been very clear that there's not a U.S. Um, military solution that can be imposed on the current uh, dynamic in Iraq. Um, actually, the fact of the matter is that um, you know, even a very extended, nearly nine-year U.S. military engagement uh, wasn't going to force Iraq's political leadership uh, to govern in an inclusive way. Ultimately, these are challenges that the Iraqis need to settle themselves. And that starts with forming an inclusive government, um, and then that includes committing to inclusive security forces that all of Iraq's communities can have confidence in. But the United States has a role to play uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, first, we're going to continue to provide uh, training and assistance and equipment to that uh, Iraqi security force. Uh, and our assessment teams who are on the ground, the uh, up to 300 uh, advisors that President Obama announced, uh, they are looking at ways in which we can uh, better uh, provide support to the Iraqi government in their fight against um, ISIL. Our joint operations centers that we've, uh, we are establishing with um, the Iraqis will help support their efforts to coordinate operations against uh, ISIL as well. But those are Iraqi uh, operations, ultimately. In terms of uh, additional U.S. military action, uh, President Obama, uh, again, made clear that uh, while he has not ordered any military action, he reserves uh, the right to do so as necessary. I think the threats that we would look to, uh, for instance, would include um, an evaluation of um, whether ISIL um, is posing um, a threat um, to U.S. interests uh, that would necessitate uh, our taking action against them, as we have against terrorist organizations um, in other parts of the region. Uh, I think the security and safety of our personnel uh, would certainly uh, be of uh, a profound interest to the United States. Um, and we've deployed additional military resources to provide for the security of our embassy in Baghdad uh, and our personnel in Iraq as well. Um, again, ultimately, that's a core interest of the United States, um, the security of our people, um, counterterrorism. Uh, and I'd add, you know, keeping that embassy open and keeping our operations running in Iraq um, is what facilitates our ability to cooperate with the Iraqi government and provide them with security assistance and political support. Uh, so we're going to be very deliberate in making any decisions about direct U.S. military action. Um, we have left that door open if we believe it can make a difference, a positive difference, uh, or if we believe that it um, is in our core interest to do so because we face a counterterrorism threat or a threat to our personnel. But ultimately, this has to be an Iraqi-led solution. Um, and that's why we're uh, focused above all on supporting an urgent and inclusive government formation process and uh, training and equipping of uh, Iraqi security forces. Uh, on Argentina, um, I don't have any particular um, engagements in the White House to read out. I know uh, we are obviously engaged with Argentina um, through uh, the State Department and other departments of the U.S. government, but President Obama has not uh, had recent conversations um, with um, the President of Argentina about these issues, um, although they have obviously seen each other at the G20. Um, again, I think we believe that um, this is not simply a bilateral matter, that there are uh, they're, they're, uh, established mechanisms for Argentina to uh, address its own um, uh, financial 
uh, commitments, um, and uh, it's going to be necessary for Argentina to do so, uh, to have the full confidence of uh, the international community, uh, to have their economy on a, on a stable footing. That's of interest to the United States. That's of interest to the region and countries like Brazil that have very deep uh, trading relationships with Argentina. So we'll, we'll, we'll encourage Argentina uh, to resolve these, uh, these issues, uh, to meet their obligations. Um, but I don't have a particular uh, engagement with President Obama to read out. Like, is there a concern that this might affect other countries that in the future might face difficulties in paying their debt and having difficulties in restructuring it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've learned a lot <laughs> in the last 10 or 20 years about financial crises in different countries. And we've learned both how to address and contain those crises um, and, try to and also how to try to support countries uh, as they seek to get uh, back on a sound fiscal footing. Um, so there's always a concern um, uh, when you see countries uh, uh, facing the type of fiscal difficulties that Argentina has faced. But there's a wealth of knowledge uh, to draw from and looking at how uh, different countries have uh, addressed uh, uh, fiscal crises. Um, and there's a lot of tools in the international community, frankly, and, and expertise to draw from uh, in seeking to resolve those issues. So we believe if countries have the political will to take difficult steps, um, it is possible uh, to, again, put a firmer foundation um, uh, underneath a fiscal crisis. And that's what we've consistently encouraged Argentina to do. Uh, Unfortunately, yep. we only have time we'll for take a couple more. Yeah. A couple yeah. more. Yeah. There you go. Um, so, so let me uh, let me just move around here, though. So, um, we, we'll take an Egypt question, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, yeah, and then yeah, we'll take three more questions. Let's take three more questions. Yeah, yeah. This is Thomas. Don't think that that's the way to get a question. I just have <laughs> not taken an Egyptian question. Can be yeah. used once. Uh, I always look for an opportunity to talk about <laughs> Egypt. Yeah, yeah. Thomas Gorgisian with the Tahrir Egyptian Daily Newspaper. Yes. The question is related to Egypt and the, the tense relation that it's living now with the United States and regarding the partnership, that the strategic partnership, you are always mentioning it. What is done or has to be done f from your perspective, from your side and the other side, to improve the relation? Yeah. This is the first one. The second one related to uh, beginning of uh, August, uh, the United States Africa Leadership Summit is going to take place. Is the President Sisi of Egypt is going to attend it? Do you in, extend your invitation to him or what? So, uh, on your first question, um, yes, the United States has a strategic partnership with Egypt, um, and President Obama uh, discussed that that partnership with uh, President uh, Sisi. Um, I'd, I'd say a, a couple things, though. Um, we recently made uh, some certifications in terms of Egypt's uh, compliance, for instance, with, its, um, with, uh, with a range of its obligations, including some of the strategic interests that we share. Um, and so as we look at the U.S.-Egypt relationship, uh, we obviously have an interest in the uh, continued peace treaty with Israel in terms of uh, regional security, counterterrorism issues. Um, and that's why you've seen us maintain uh, a degree of cooperation um, and a relationship with Egypt on the security side. But we did not make the certification on uh, the progress towards democracy. Um, and in terms of what we need to see, uh, I think we have consistently pointed to uh, a number of different issues that are of concern to us. Uh, number one, um, it is outrageous that these Al Jazeera journalists are still in prison in Egypt. Um, there is no basis for detaining them. Uh, you can't lock people up just for reporting the news, even if you don't like it. Um, and so we believe that there needs to be a resolution to those cases um, and that the notion that there's a judicial system that overrides any ability to deal with that challenge is one that you know, we just don't accept um, because the fact is there's no demonstrable crime of which these people are guilty of. Um, and again, you know, uh, Egypt um, clearly has a vibrant um, uh, media environment, uh, and lots of voices have been raised in Egypt over the last two or three years. That's part of what has brought us where we are today. In that spirit, we'd like to see respect for independent media, uh, and I think the clearest indication of that would be um, the release of those journalists. Uh, I think more broadly, um, even as we've seen uh, an election held, uh, you know, there are still concerning detentions of different political activists, um, uh, in including, for instance, not just 
um, members of the Freedom and Justice Party, but some of the secular activists who actually supported um, the removal of the Morsi government. Some of them, uh, I think, have been confronted with harassment and detention. Uh, so we'd like to see that, um, uh, that type of action uh, uh, come to an end. Um, and I think more broadly, just see that there's a pathway towards um, a, a truly inclusive Egyptian uh, democracy. Um, yes, Egypt needs strong leadership um, from President Sisi. Uh, yes, uh, the Egyptian military uh, is an incredibly important institution within Egypt. Um, but at the same time, the long-term stability and success of Egypt is going to depend upon um, all of Egyptians being able uh, to express their views um, freely, uh, to participate in the political process freely. Um, if we see Egypt moving in that direction, I think it uh, broadens our ability to um, fully restore our assistance relationship and deepen that strategic partnership. And it's very important to note that that's what we want. <laughs> you know, we want Egypt to succeed. Uh, we want the United States to have a full and robust assistance relationship. And in fact, uh, we have been looking at ways that we could increase it uh, through things like enterprise funds and support for education. Um, but it's hard for us to do that if we uh, don't see progress in some of these other areas that get at kind of core uh, universal rights that, you know, frankly, the Egyptian people um, so clearly uh, demanded uh, a number of years ago. So uh, we believe there's a good platform for cooperation, uh, that we're better off when we cooperate. The strategic relationship is in place uh, with President Sisi and the Egyptian government, uh, but we would like to see um, a, a broader uh, and deeper uh, partnership, frankly, between the U.S. and Egypt. Uh, and I think that can come about if we see progress in some of the specific areas that I mentioned. On the summit, I don't, you know, this was um, uh, an initial determination made based upon um, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, Egypt was uh, not in uh, uh, full standing with the African Union. Um, so as that process works through the African Union, uh, I think we'll make determinations about invitations. I don't think we've made those yet. Um, but so that's something that we'll, uh, we'll be making a decision about here um, uh, in the coming days uh, in, in con conversation with the afternoon. But again, it's important to note we want this relationship to succeed um, at some cost to the United, you know, to, to uh, look, it hasn't been easy for us to um, at, at times uh, defend the sustainment of this relationship. Um, through the various ups and downs that have taken place. The reason that we've maintained the relationship is because it is so important to us. Egypt is important to the United States. The Egyptian people are important to us. Um, and we believe that, the bet, you know, that the cutting the cord on that relationship would be a bad thing, uh, not just for our strategic interests, but frankly for our, uh, uh, the values that we want to see um, uh, that the Egyptian people have uh, stood up for. So uh, we've maintained that connection, but again, there's a much broader a horizon that can be reached, much broader cooperation that can be achieved uh, if we see Egypt take some of these concrete steps. Uh, you have this gentleman here. Luqman Ahmed, uh, BBC Arabic here from Washington. Uh, I have a couple of questions on uh, Sudan. Uh, first, I will take you to Darfur. It's, uh, there are two million uh, people for more than 10 years uh, staying in uh, refugee camp after the war in Darfur in 2003. Uh, the report uh, from the UN uh, shows that the situation there is very dire and people are dying every day because of hunger and disease after the Sudanese government expelled uh, the international organization and helped them uh, out of the country. What is your, is, and, and right now reportedly some of these refugees are getting back home. What is your strategy dealing with this uh, refugee? Are you supporting staying there uh, with the status quo in the refugee camps or trying to do more action that will have a solution so these people can go back home? And the second uh, question is, uh, we know that Maryam Yahya is in the U.S. Embassy uh, in Sudan trying to get uh, to the United States of America. The, your government is negotiating with the Sudanese government uh, her exit. Any progress on that? What are the problems that are preventing Hano to get out till now? Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a specific progress report on that. Um, I do know that the State Department is providing her with uh, all of the support that they can, um, and uh, her and her husband, uh, for that matter. Um, and this is an ongoing uh, discussion with the Sudanese government. Obviously, we were outraged by 
uh, the charges against her. We believe that uh, she needs to be released and uh, have the freedom to make uh, her own determinations about her future. Um, but a state is best positioned to talk about the, the current status of negotiations. Um, with respect to uh, Darfur and the refugee camps, you know, I, I think the, um, there have been a number of things that we uh, would encourage. Um, first of all, there needs to be uh, full access for international organizations, NGOs, um, uh, to the refugee camps and to some of these more difficult areas uh, in and around Darfur. Uh, at times, we've seen limits placed on that type of access. Um, we want to, uh, the international community to be able to provide full support both to those who are in camps and to those who are seeking uh, to resettle. Um, and so, uh, essentially, uh, the message to the Sudanese government is that they need to cooperate fully uh, with the international community, including uh, different aid organizations in the UN, uh, to allow for that access and to help uh, to, to, to let the international community help uh, people who are in need both in the camps and, and people who are seeking to, to resettle. Uh, at the same time, um, there needs to be a follow-through on all the commitments that the government has made uh, in terms about respecting the rights of minority populations, uh, in terms of cracking down on uh, uh, acts and incidents of violence against vulnerable populations. Um, and so uh, that's something that we've seen uh, frankly, uh, there'd be a very mixed record on. At times, uh, there is cooperation. At times, uh, it slips back. Um, and I think the point is that there needs to be a sustained focus uh, on uh, ensuring peace in this area uh, in terms of cracking down and holding accountable those who commit acts of violence uh, against civilians um, at the same time that, uh, again, there's an effort that allows the international community to, to support these vulnerable populations. Um, so. Uh, this has been an ongoing focus for the United States and the international community for, for years, um, and uh, ultimately the, the measure of success is only going to be when uh, people are allowed to uh, live without fear uh, to return home or, re or resettle to places that they so choose uh, and to not have the type of threat of violence that has hung over them um, uh, for so long. I'll take one more question. Um, yes, uh, the woman there. Yeah. Thank you, Patty Colhane, Al Jazeera English. You've repeatedly called for both sides to show restraint, Israel and Palestine. Do you feel the Israelis are showing restraint right now? And you also mentioned earlier that you were trying to help Israel find the perpetrators. What exactly is the U.S. doing in that role? Well, on the second question, um, the uh, you know, frankly, the, we've just offered um, to provide whatever assistance we can, um, and. Uh, yeah, they, they've accepted, but at the same time, in, in, in their own neighborhood, uh, they tend to have substantial intelligence resources and law enforcement resources. But insofar as we have any information, uh, we are going to share that with them. Um, we've had a dialogue with their security officials, for instance, so this has been a topic of discussion uh, in terms of uh, seeking to determine whether we can provide any additional support on the intelligence and law enforcement side. Uh, but, you know, they, they have... Uh, uh, again, tended to have the, the clearest understanding of what um, uh, is taking place and when it uh, pertains to issues um, in their immediate environment. On your, um, on your first question, um, look, I think um, Israel clearly has a very uh, deeply held belief that they need to provide for the security of their citizens. And when you have um, three teenagers who are um, abducted and killed, there has to be a response. Uh, and th th there has to be uh, an effort to find those who are responsible uh, and bring them to justice. Um, and there has to be an understanding in the Palestinian leadership that uh, there, there, there should be cooperation with Israel in those efforts. And you know, President Abbas has, I think, made uh, very constructive statements to that end uh, in, in offering the cooperation of the Palestinian Authority. But Israel needs to be very careful um, to not um, be so heavy-handed in its response uh, that they're further destabilizing the situation. Uh, and they need to respect uh, the dignity of the Palestinian people. Um, and so that's what we'll continue to urge uh, going forward, and ultimately that's um, what's going to be in their best interest. Uh, you want to take a follow-up? Uh, sure. Yeah. Are launching airstrikes uh, an attempt to find the perpetrators? Well, I won't get into tactical advice to the Israelis. I mean, clearly... Um, some of those were related to rocket fire from Gaza. But no, I mean, I, I think generally uh, they should be precise uh, and they should not uh, cast a net that harms innocent Palestinians in their actions. 